Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here in this uh, very interesting uh, conference. Um, so I'm going to present this paper, Slicing the Pie, that I wrote uh, together with Simon Galli and uh, Moises Yi. And um, the motivation, I think, for this paper is, is quite uh, simple. Uh, there's been a lot of work on gravity models. Um, Dave Donaldson was presenting a model that is an extension of a gravity model. And we've used these models a lot for parsimonious, uh, quite transparent uh, quantification of the aggregate welfare effects of trade. Um, and at the same time, there's been a growing and very uh, influential literature on more on the empirical side, showing large distributional effects of trade. So this is what um, Lorenzo was referring to uh, just a bit ago, that uh, there's all this, all this new work, and I'll, I'll say more about this in a bit. Uh, what we haven't yet done that much of is to come up with ways of talking about the aggregate effects at the same time as we can say something about the distribution of effects. And so that's what this paper uh, attempts to do, is to bridge these two literatures and quantify the aggregate and distribution effects of the China shock in the US. So let me say a little bit about both of these literatures. Um, on the gravity and welfare, um, again, as uh, Dave was mentioning, the, um, there's been, uh, over the last decades, several trade models uh, that provide micro foundations for a gravity equation. Uh, these are the Armington model, the Krugman model, the Eaton Cortum, and the Mellis model with a Pareto distribution. All of these models are gravity models, and, and quite particular gravity models that have the feature that basically uh, a single parameter together with the trade data is all that is needed to conduct counterfactual analysis. And once you do that counterfactual analysis, you don't only are able to see what the impact is of some say, policy shock on uh, trade flows, but also uh, look at the welfare implication of that. Um, here we're going to use a multi-sector version of these models um, with Cobb Douglas preferences. And um, we're, one of the key, the key uh, parameter that, that we need is the, um, uh, the trade elasticity, which I'm going to call by theta s. And uh, for simplicity, we're just going to set that theta s to 5, which is, again, uh, what Dave was doing. Now, once you do that, this kind of analysis basically tells you something like the US aggregate gains from the China shock, um, something I'll describe, I'll describe, I'll be more uh, explicit in a bit, gives aggregate gains of approximately 0.3% for the US over the period 2000 to 2011. Okay, so that's what gravity, the gravity models can tell us. It doesn't tell us anything about the distribution implications. And so uh, in parallel to the development of this literature, there's this other literature, most, exemplified, most clearly exemplified by uh, the author Dorn and Hanson China Syndrome paper in 2013, uh, which focuses on local labor markets in the US and empirically shows that there is a relative decline in wages and employment for communion zones most exposed to competition from increasing imports from China. Um, in that paper and in subsequent work, there's been a lot of additional exploration about uh, what other uh, implications of the China shock so we see that federal transfers increase to communion zones that are more exposed uh, to the China shock. Marriage goes down. Suicide and drug overdose increases. There's electoral polarization. And there's even one of the papers that, are, that uh, Otter, Don, and Hanson and co-authors have written says that it may even have delivered Trump. So um, the one missing piece of this literature is welfare. So the empirical methodology uh, that is, is used in those papers is able only to identify relative effects. You can say that most more exposed groups or community zones are uh, negatively affected relative to the groups that were less exposed. But 
the increase in imports are also uh, going to lead to benefits thanks to lower prices in the standard models. And so we want to take into account those lower prices to think about absolute effects. We want to ask not only are groups worse off relative to some other groups, but we want to ask are groups worse off in absolute terms. For example, if we think about the, the specific factors model, we know that a factor that is specific to a sector where imports go up, then that factor is going to lose in terms of relative income. But if there are gains from trade, um, then uh, say because of intra-industry trade, that's lowering prices and that may lead to even those factors that are most exposed to uh, increasing imports to gain overall. Now to be able to, to, to do this, we need to um, go back to a general equilibrium model and in particular what we're going to do in this paper is to go back to the gravity models I was described before, but allow these uh, issues of uh, fact, uh, factor specificity uh, to play a role and allow some groups to be um, to gain less or perhaps even to lose uh, relative to others. Okay, the way we're going to do it is we're going to take the gravity model and add this uh, ROI component to it. So the idea is going to be that uh, instead of the in the standard multi-sector gravity, workers are homogeneous and perfectly mobile. So there is just one wage. And there is no such thing as workers attached to one sector or the other. Um, in the other extreme, workers are stuck in their sector. That's the case of specific factors. Uh, what we're doing uh, here is to adopt this uh, Roy Frechet um, approach to the labor market so that we're in between these two extremes. And um, this is going to be uh, governed by this parameter kappa that is between one and infinity that's going to determine where we are. If that's infinity, then we're here. If that's one, then we're here. And the higher, the, the lower that kappa is, the more we are in the world where workers are stuck in sectors. And so if there is this uh, import competition shock, then they're going to be most affected. The, the workers that are exposed to those sectors are, are most affected. OK. so. Um, there's a bunch of papers that have been written um, in this area, um, um, many of them by people that are here. Uh, they're, I'm, I'm following loud and saying they're all cited, and, and you can look at the paper for that. Um, and yesterday, as I was trying to make the presentation fit into 20 minutes, I ended up cutting most of the models. There's two slides uh, on the model. One is simply to say, we're going to build this gravity model that has uh, a bunch of countries, uh, N countries indexed by I, a uh, bunch of sectors indexed by S, and then there's going to be groups inside each country that we're going to index by IJ. So this is going to be some group in country I. Um, and so groups can be differentiated by the place where they live or their skill in our empirical, in a, in our empirical application. We're all actually going to have groups that are uh, by commuting zone and skill. So there's going to be commuting zone high skill is a group, uh, commuting zone low skill is another group. Um, and then uh, I'm just going to show you one equation. This is uh, to give you a flavor of the kind of um, result that comes out of this model where we're putting together a gravity model with this Roy Frechet simple way of thinking about uh, the labor market and, and worker heterogeneity uh, moving across different sectors. So this WIJ is the welfare, real income, of workers in group IJ. I should, I should be explicit here, uh, we're not going to be talking about distributional implications inside a group, but across groups. So this is all between group uh, distributional effects. So group IJ, this is the change in the... Um, uh, this hat is the proportional change in um, um, the welfare of group IJ after some shock. That's going to be equal to these two components. This first component is the one that we would have in the standard multi-sector uh, gravity model. 
these lambdas are how much you trade with yourself of the total sh of the total expenditure in sector S, how much A I devotes to its own uh, good. Uh, this is the change in that, and then elevated to this minus beta I S over theta. Beta IES are the Cobb Douglas shares of expenditure in sector S, so how important is sector S? And then theta is the, the trade elasticity. Uh, you see that there's no G here. So this is common to groups. And that's the sense in which in the standard analysis, there are no distributional implications. Now what we're adding is the second term, which we're calling this uh, the, the new uh, group level ROI term. It has these pies. These pies are the employment shares. So group IJ, how much, how many uh, of the workers in group IJ are employed in sector S? And then this is the change in those pies, again, elevated to the beta IS, and now divided by that kappa that I was talking about before. Notice that if kappa goes to infinity, then this is going to go, uh, this is going to go to one, and so this disappears, and we're back to the world uh, of the multi-sector gravity model, okay? Now, um, what we're interested in, in a sense, is, well, first, we need to estimate this kappa and this theta, and then we need to um, figure out what the China shock is and how the China shock affects uh, these lambda hats and pi hats, plug them into this formula, and get the implication for the absolute change in welfare for group IJ. Uh, okay, so the way we're going to do it, we're going to focus on the U.S. Uh, so our I, we're going to uh, restrict I to be the U.S. Um, and then we're going to have this data for the U.S. labor market coming from the census and the American uh, Community Survey data. Uh, we have group employment shares at the communion zone skill by, by skill level. We, um, we have, a, in that way, uh, uh, 1,444 groups. These are the 722 communion zones uh, multiplied by two. Uh, we have uh, 14 sectors, 13 of which are manufacturing sectors, and the time period is 2000 to 2011. And then we are going to put this together with the trade data from the World Input Output Database. So we have the multi-country, multi-sector gravity framework, but in the U.S. we're zooming in to have all these groups. For all the other countries, we just have one group. Okay, so as I said, we have these two key elasticities. Uh, theta is something or, on which there is uh, already a, a big literature, and we're not going to say anything on that. I'm just going to do the simple thing of uh, assuming it's, it's five for all sectors. Uh, for kappa, what we're going to do is we're going to combine empirical and theoretical elements to estimate kappa. So on the empirical side, we're going to build on the fact that from the work of Otto Dorn and Hanson, we know that higher exposure to the China shock leads to a contraction of manufacturing employment. And then from our theoretical uh, model, we get that a decline in manufacturing employment caused by the, uh, some, some um, um, international shock is going to lead to an, a decline in relative income that depends on kappa. Formally, um, this is the key equation that we get from the model. We get the change in average income for group G. Uh, this is what happens to the wage in non-manufacturing in the US. This is the change in employment in non-manufacturing for group G. Um, and this is some error term that depends on productivity shocks uh, in that group. And then what this, th this is the key part, this is saying if, if some foreign shock leads to a, an increase in non-manufacturing, so you're being pushed out of manufacturing into non-manufacturing, you're going to see a decline in your average income, and that's going to depend on this one over kappa uh, coefficient. And so what we're going to do is we're going to borrow from the Otterdorn Hanson paper to construct an instrument uh, to run this as an IV regression and recover the one over kappa. Okay, so here are the results. Um, we get the first stage is, uh, is, um, has enough power, and although here it's sort of borderline, but um, we, the, um, the, uh, the regression is saying the result, uh, the coefficient is negative, and then when we get the implied kappa, we get number, a number that is around two. And we've done a bunch of robustness analysis with this, and, and um, 
uh, this number of two, it could come down to 1.5, it could be a little bit higher, uh, but two is sort of a, a good number based on all the different exercises we've done. And so let me now show you what the implications are of our model with this kappa equal to two. Um, one thing we need to do is to calibrate the China shock. So we're gonna borrow here from um, a, a procedure that uh, Lorenzo and co-authors developed. Basically what we're doing is we see China exporting more to other countries. We regress how much US imports, for, uh, the increase in US imports from China on those Chinese exports to other countries. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, think about, in our model, how big are the productivity sh uh, changes in China so as to generate those projected changes in U.S. imports from China. That's gonna be the China shock, and so these are, these are the key results. This is the main uh, um, table of the paper. Um, so here, for different kappas, we show what is the overall U.S. Uh, welfare change the mean across all the groups, the coefficient of variation, and the mean and the max. So focus on our uh, preferred value for kappa, uh, and notice the range in the uh, uh, welfare changes. These are percent welfare changes. So what this is saying is that there's some group that gains 1.34% thanks to the China shock, and then there's a group that loses 1.64%. This group is losing five times uh, as much as the average gain in the U.S. So there, there are groups that have significant losses. These are not huge losses. These are not 10% losses, 1.6%. Uh, and the groups that have negative numbers here correspond to around 7% of the U.S. population. So it's a non-negligible share of the population that is actually experiencing now, we can say, not only a, a negative relative, but um, a negative absolute um, uh, decline in welfare as a consequence of the China shock. Here's a map of how uh, that um, lays out. This is for low educated workers and for high and for high educated workers. It's not too different. One thing we see is that the groups that are losing tend to be concentrated geographically to some extent. So there's this region of. Uh, the Appalachia region, region here, some, uh, some parts of Southern California, and other parts um, in the US where there's some concentration of these losses. Now, um, one, one uh, thing we can do is, is uh, to notice that uh, there is a Bartik style measure of group level import competition that actually turns out to be a very good uh, sufficient statistic for at least for the relative income part. Um, and this is sort of, a, of, of independent interest. So if we define IG to be uh, a measure of import competition for group G, this, is, this beta is the expenditure share, and this R is the revenue share at the US level. So a high beta over R means that there's a lot of import competition in sector S, right? You're importing more than you're producing. Uh, and this is then weighted for a particular group with the employment shares across those sectors. So if you happen to have a lot of employment in sectors where there's a lot of imports, then your IG is going to be high. It turns out that uh, a good approximation in our model for what's happening to the change in the relative income of group G uh, relative to the uh, economy as a whole is What's happening to is just this Bartik um, measure, which is just the change in this import competition index over time, but now divided by kappa. So this is just a very, very intuitive expression. Uh, how does the shock affect the size of the different sectors? How exposed are you, are you as a group to those different sectors? And then you divide by kappa, and that gives you how your relative income is going to be affected by that. So um, when we, we, what we do is again run a regression uh, to, to check on that and we see that uh, things line up as, uh, as the model would imply. This actually gives us a, a new way of estimating kappa and we get number, a number that is around 1.5. Let me just conclude with this. Um, 
once you have, um, we don't longer have the representative agent. We have all these different groups. Some of them gain, some of them lose. How do we go back to thinking about does the economy as a whole gain or lose? When the economy is on, when, uh, in that survey that Lorenzo was presenting, when you're uh, asked, uh, does the economy gain, if you put all your weight on the groups that are losing, then you should say, no, the economy is not gaining. Well, the question is, how much weight should you put on the groups that are losing? So what we did for, for that is a very simple exercise. We, we thought of this, uh, think about the utility of an agent behind the veil of ignorance. There's different ways of thinking about this, but if you think about agents don't know yet to which group they're going to belong, they're behind the veil, and there is some risk aversion um, indexed or, or captured by that parameter rho, then we can do our analysis and think about what is the welfare change now for that agent behind the, the, the veil, or just think about it as social welfare, uh, taking into account risk aversion of the agent behind the veil or just inequality aversion. So with this I finish. Um, here's the, here are the results. So here on the, vert, on the horizontal axis we have this row. Um, and what he, we have here is the, um, the numbers from the um, uh, table I was showing you before now fed in to that inequality adjusted welfare formula. And what you see is that it is in fact the case that the groups that tend to be poorer tend to be the ones that are faring worse from the China shock. And so there is a reason why, that's, that's the reason why this, as we increase inequality aversion, the, the gains, the inequality adjusted gains are falling. But for our cap equal two, it would take you would need to go to a very high level of inequality aversion to get this number to become negative. If kappa is lower than two, then even, even uh, you need a high uh, level of rho. Now, what is a high level of rho? We have an analysis in the paper that says a reasonable number is between one and four. It's hard to justify a number above four. So if you go with that, then you could say again that the US gains from trade even taking into account that there are losers, as long as you have sort of a reasonable, and there's, that's, that's debatable, a reasonable measure of inequality aversion. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Andres, and the discussion is Oleg Itchkoki. So I am that Russian that's supposed to hack the session. Uh, as long as I can find my slides. Um, so I, I must thank the organizers for inviting me to discuss this paper. Uh, it's, um, sorry, it was a complete pleasure to read this paper, as many of Andres's other papers that I've read. Um, so I, I, my comments will be in two parts. The first part will be about the model, and the second part will be about the relationship of the model to the data. Right, and just to give you a, a bit of a background, so what this uh, what what this paper aims to do is to develop a sort of a benchmark framework um, uh, which can quantify the gains from trade, which does not shy away from distributional consequences, right? And a bit of a history of thought on this is that uh, the trade literature has largely moved away from models that emphasize distributional consequences such as actual and unspecific factors in favor of the quantitative models of trade which sort of ignored this dimension of the data, right? Uh, so, so these were very successful quantitative models for describing the trade flows, but they completely shut down the distributional uh, consequences, right? And so in particular, if you think about the leading quantitative framework, the Ricardian and Etam Corto model, it just doesn't allow for the analysis of distributional effects, right? And so that's, g given the current policy focus, that's a major deficiency of that literature. And so that's exactly uh, sort of the gap that Andres with his co-authors are trying to fill uh, in, uh, in this research, right? And so this paper that uh, uh, Andres presented, it's, 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 it's a marriage between this Ricardian quantitative trade model and the Roy labor market sorting model, right? And so the, the co combining the two, you can maintain a lot of the beauty of the Ricardian trade model for explaining trade flows, and yet you can open sort of the ability to discuss uh, the distributional consequences in this model. And so specifically the way they're gonna do it, uh, they're gonna uh, 
uh, use the Etham uh, core to magic of Frisch distributions, and they would put it in two places, right? So they, they're going to keep it for the productivity draws of the country at the sectoral level. So you have country I, and country will have comparative productivity advantage in industries S, and this comes from a particular productivity distribution, uh, which has that, uh, so, so it's going to be specifically a free share with a mean parameter T. So countries that are good in sector S will have a large shifter TIS, right? And so the beauty of it is that you can immediately characterize what will be the trade shares, right? So how much a country I uh, will export to country S and sector, uh, to country J and sector S will be given by sort of that simple formula, which basically says countries that have bigger productivity shifters T uh, will have larger export shares in those sectors, right? Adjusted for trade costs and wages in the countries, right? And so this is the quantitative uh, Ethan Porto model of trade. So what they're going to add to this is, is now uh, uh, output will be produced by different workers. Workers will be in different groups G. So in each country I, there would be different groups G of workers. And these groups of workers will be differentially skilled in different sectors. So some, some workers will be more skilled. Uh, some workers in some groups G will be more skilled in some sectors S. And this will also be governed by a productivity distribution with the shifters A, I, G, S, which are country, uh, group and sector specific, right? And so what, what, what emerges uh, from this model is the allocation of workers to different sectors, right, in, from different groups. And it's governed by similar type of formula. So, so the workers in country I in group J, G uh, will be more likely to work in sector S if they have a large shifter in that sector, right? And this is a formula that's very sort of similar to the trade formula from the Ethan Porto model. And it turns out sort of this marriage between the Ricardian model and the Royal Labor Sorting model is a very happy one. It's, a, it's, 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 it's a, an incredibly elegant model and very tractable. And it's kind of like when you read it, it's an obvious model that you want to teach to your students, right? You want to like derive everything on the board, show the students every step, and that get to final results. And they have lots of intuition in them. And this is sort of the type of intuition that we love to teach our students, right? And so in particular, the key result that uh, this model delivers is that you can characterize welfare gains from trade at the group level of workers, right? Not at the aggregate, but for each group of workers, right? So you can you can choose how you split your data into different groups of workers, and for each group, you're going to have the welfare gain formula. And this welfare gain formula generalizes what we sort of knew from the previous literature in very natural ways, right? So in particular, now for group G, I, I emitted country I, so say US group uh, group G of workers. There would be two terms that characterize their gains. One is the first familiar term, which comes uh, sort of gains from trade on the consumer side, right? And so uh, if you see it for the first time, I guess it doesn't look that intuitive, but this just shows up in virtually every paper right now. So the idea is the following. Lambda, in that you see that formula is some weighted average of lambdas. And so those lambdas are how much the country supplies itself. And if the country supplies a lot itself, almost entirely, then there are no gains from trade, right? So essentially, gains from trade emerge in the situations when the country doesn't supply itself as much and buys goods from other countries. This is when the gains from trade emerge. You really need to buy stuff from other countries for the gains from trade. And this is this first term. And so basically, the more the country, the less the country buys from itself, and the more it buys from other countries, the more it gains from trade on the consumer side. And so that, that's been in sort of a large previous literature. So what this paper adds is the second term. And the second term is about the income gains of the specific group of workers. And this could be income gains or income losses. And so when, I, so when Andres showed the formula, he showed it not in log changes, but he showed it in levels. And that's why it looked like products. So for me, it's in, in, in log changes. So it's like percentage gains. And that's why, to me, it's a little more uh, sort of easy to interpret this equation. So the second term is the weighted average of pies. And remember what the pies were. The pies were this allocation shares of workers to different sectors. And at first, when I saw it, I didn't think it was particularly intuitive, but, but there is actually a beautiful intuition behind it. So imagine that this group of workers were in autarky. Then the workers would allocate according to expenditure shares for each sector. And those are exactly the weights. So, uh, so the workers in this group would need to produce every good, right? And then there are no gains from specialization. So the gains from specialization of workers arise when, when there is more dispersion of workers to different groups, right? So when, when workers don't have to supply everything, they can outsource basically production of tasks to other groups. And so if you look at that formula, it looks a bit like an entropy. And the gains are the biggest one that is the biggest entropy away from 
the expenditure shares, right? And so this is the intuition. So the groups of workers will gain if they can specialize more as a result of trade in sectors where they're particularly good, rather than producing everything sort of like an autarky. And so this is sort of very intuitive, right? These are the two terms that sort of now, uh, uh, now seem quite intuitive. One is on the consumer side and the other one on the income side, right? So there is a clear intuition coming from this formula is that workers in group G might lose from trade if, as a result of trade, they have to go away from sectors where they have comparative advantage, right? So before they traded, workers could go where they're particularly productive, but if the country is not productive in the sectors in which the workers are particularly good, the workers might, leave, might need to leave those sectors, and this is when they're gonna lose. And think about China and US. If there were workers that were particularly productive, say, in furniture, and China is really good on furniture, these workers will have to leave the furniture industry, and this is exactly when they might lose from trade, right? And so now, given this formula, you can sort of quantify uh, you know, the empirical systems of any dimensions with any number of sectors and any number of like worker groups. You just have to take a stand up on how you slice the data, and you just you know, immediately put it uh, here. So th there are a couple of notable features here. So first of all, there is this result that there would be more gains than in a model without uh, groups of workers. And so the way I interpret the intuition behind this, there are more gains because there is more dimensions on which this model can adjust, right? When kappa is less than infinity, workers can resort the industries, and as a result, there is this additional dimension of adjustment, and this additional dimension of adjustment gives, in general, bigger gains from trade. I'm not sure if this is the right intuition, but this is how I understood the result. Um, the second theoretical result here is that, in general, when you're going to aggregate these gains, even if you don't have risk aversion and equality aversion, the second term is not going to go away. So you're not going to get the same formula as in a, in a model without heterogeneity of workers. So those heterogeneity terms, in some potentially complicated ways, will affect the aggregate gains from trade, right? Uh, and the third result um, is that you can take this and now start thinking not just about average gains from trade, but do an inequality adjusted gains from trade. So if some groups are losing, you can put bigger weights on the, those groups and see uh, basically what would it take for the country to still gain from trade. So I had one comment here that I wanted to make is basically this model has in principle a lot to say about residual inequality. So this characterizes the average gains from group G, but you can look inside the group. So inside the, each group, there would be people who happen to be particularly skilled in one sector, but not in the other sector. And so in particular, there could be quite a lot of residual inequality, right? So what's interesting about this model, there is a single parameter that drives both the elasticity of, subs elasticity of switching between different sectors and the within group inequality, right? And the question is, once you match kappa to the data on switching between different sectors, do you hit residual inequality as well? And this is something that you can easily look at. And so one obvious thing I think that you should do is just theoretically adjust welfare for this residual inequality, because people are not the same in the group. You can calculate, when you calculate the inequality adjusted welfare, you can adjust for this residual inequality, right? So this seems like a natural extension. And also then you can ask whether these changes in the residual inequality that the model predicts also go in line with what happens in the data. Because we know that it's not just skilled, unskilled dimension of the data where the inequality changes, but also the within group. And so I was not quite sure whether the model predicts systematic changes in the within group inequality as well. And this sort of seems like a natural thing that you could do given the model. Um, so the paper finds that there are overall gains from trade but there is fairly large variation across these groups of workers. What I found surprising, what Andres didn't emphasize in the presentation, and it's sort of mentioned in passing in the, in the paper, is that the way they're gonna do the groups of workers is mostly geography and then skill, right? So they look at commuter zones, these are different groups of workers, and also high skill and low skill. And so it turns out that the model predicts that the main dimension of variation and gains is the geographical one. It's not the high skill versus low skill. So in particular, when you look the at the geographical correlation of how high skill and low skill fare, the correlation between that is 0.87, if I got it correctly. And so my reading of the empirical literature was that it was actually saying that there is a big difference in how skilled and unskilled workers fare in given geographies, right? And so that seemed to me at odds with what the model predicts. So in particular, from Otter, Dorn, and Hansen, my, my um, reading of that literature was that basically the skilled workers could adjust much better in the affected geographies. They had lower duration of um, unemployment and lower income losses in the same geographies that were affected. And so I was sort of wondering 
uh, what feature of the data make you sort of make your inference otherwise, right? And then whether it's consistent or not with the Southern empirical literature. Okay, so now, I, I, again, everything about the model is super elegant and I sort of totally loved that part of the paper where I was less convinced. I mean, clearly th this paper makes a step towards closing the gap to the empirical literature. There is no question about that. So where I was not convinced is how large that step is, right? So, and how much more work is needed to go all the way to understand the yeah, empirical side of it, right? So in particular, I'm gonna sort of c comment on a few low hanging things about the sort of this connection between empirical and theoretical part. Uh, so basically, this is a long run model. So the, the model focuses on the long run adjustment and because workers are heterogeneous, some workers might lose and some workers might gain in the long run. If you talk with most policymakers, they would probably emphasize the transitionary sort of losses that you have when you adjust to trade. While they would agree that there might be long run gains, it takes a long time to get to those gains. And during this transition process, you, you, it, it might be a very frictional process and this is the, the time when, when a lot of uh, uh, losses are realized, right? And so this puts us sort of into a position where we need to figure out, should we use long run, long run models with different group of workers or should we use sort of short run transition models where workers are sort of ex ante the same but ex post they were attached to different industries or different firms and then they need to make their transition and this is what results in transitory gains. And so the problem of the theoretical literature here is that most models of transition that we have, the transition is just too fast. You know, what we learn from the data is that these transitions are remarkably slow in the data, that, that, that the Rust Belt can persist for a number of generations, basically, right? And so how do, you do it, uh, how do you do it in the model properly, right? So the next question I had is what are the right definitions of groups G? So here is geography and skill, but in principle, it's not clear why geography and skill is a fixed characteristic and the industry is something that you can change, right? So what the model takes a stand on is that you cannot change your geography and skill, but you can change the industry within that geography and skill. And so you, you can define uh, uh, industries and geographies in a very flexible way, but you have to take a stand on sort of these two characteristics. And so it was not obvious to me why people born in a particular location are endowed with particular skills that are different by location, right? So what I can see, that it could be a parable for a different story, that you're in a location where there was a particular firm that was particularly good at doing something, and you're attached to that firm, and that makes you good. But once that firm leaves, you lose your skill, right? Because your skill was in this, you know, inseparable with the firm where you worked, right? So, so it's a human capital specificity, but it's not about sort of a particular industry. It's about sort of being matched in a location to a particular firm. And if China competition wipes out certain firms, you will lose those jobs, and there are no equivalent firms to find, right? Uh, so, so, the other, um, so, so the other problem, oh, give me one more minute. So, so, the, so, so the other problem in this literature, so if this were firms, right, then the question is, well, China wiped out these types of firms and there is all this labor that in principle is potentially skilled, but why new firms are not coming to those locations? So you need some type of a very particular strong agglomeration forces that basically you have all the skilled manufacturing workers in the Rust Belt they, they cannot be employed in industries that compete with China, but there are many other industries which, which, which are highly productive in the US. And the question is, why wouldn't firm go to where the labor is cheap? And so the answer to that is maybe that at no price of that labor, the firms want to hire them because of some sort of strong agglomeration forces. The firms all want to be located somewhere else. And so this is a big puzzle for the, uh, for the literature. And so the last thing I was going to say is that sort of the mod this is completely on the surface. The model features no unemployment and no non-employment. And arguably in the data, that's where it's sort of the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, uh, margins of adjustment. So you have to write down frictional models. So this is actually exactly the area where I worked on. I wanted to advertise my research, but I sort of don't have time for this. I'm, what, what I'm going to say is the, we know how to write down models with frictional labor markets where it takes time for workers to connect to firms, but these workers don't nearly deliver as large effects as we see in the data. And sort of the two features are problematic is that if it's really costly to find a new job, the firms and the worker will just renegotiate and keep the old jobs because, well, the wages will just fall down. So you need some mechanism why sort of adjustment happens through unemployment and not through wages going down in these locations. And the second is what I mentioned is like why firms would not move where you have abundant labor. And so these are sort of these big questions for frictional models. And so what, what I'm, let me conclude by saying sort of I completely love the paper. It's super elegant. I think it's something that I will definitely teach in my classes.
On the other hand, clearly there is a huge gap from what we know theoretically and from what we know empirically, and sort of obviously closing that gap is the big topic for, for more research. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe Ariel and Andres can go to the table and answer a few questions. Hi, I didn't hear anyone specify labor unions as part of any of the factors, and I wanted to hear more about that. A question for Andres. Um, do you think that uh, differences in the composition of uh, consumption baskets for the different groups are quantitatively relevant to factor um, results about different welfare implications? So also for Andres and building on Oleg's discussion, um, I think it would be really interesting to look at within groups, but rather than geography, potentially industry. And so um, Oleg res raised the point, are, are these firms, is it is this decline in employment, all these firms exiting? So actually, in some new work with co-authors, we're finding that the decline in US manufacturing employment from 77 to 2012, 75% of it occurs within firms that continue to exist. So it doesn't seem like there's massive exit of firms. And so there, th there's some reason why it's different workers that are getting affected, and maybe part of it is that these firms are switching out of manufacturing, but they're, but the workers change that they hire. Or it's robots. to uh, project the effects of mass automation as opposed to immigration, because in terms of their effects on the labor supply and the wages of workers, it seems like they wouldn't be that uh, different, theoretically at least. I have uh, one question for each two. So to Ariel first. What about licensing? I mean, it seems that one of the impediments for some of these immigrants to go into certain occupations is that, you know, there's a bunch of licensing requirements where you need to go through either local education or some certification in order to be able to access those industries. That's another policy that we could cha change and be maybe very complementary to the type of effects that you're, you're finding. So if you can comment on that. Uh, and then to Andres, is worker mobility. So, I mean, w in what sense is it okay to think about these, w these groups as, uh, you know, fixed and not, not people not moving across locations? So a couple of responses to, to your question. So all our results are robust if we exclude communication intensive or routine intensive uh, occupations. Uh, so that's kind of one check we did to, to rule out alternative uh, mechanisms. In terms of the, the, the question of unionization, I think it's, it's um, oh, I'm sure, very important. So one of the things we checked is, so one of the results we have is that there's much less um, there's no, there's neither crowding in or crowding out within the set of trade occupations, as opposed to crowding out within the set of non-trade occupations. That's the main result that I emphasized. So, with one one issue, one it could be that maybe the um, trade occupations are much more unionized, let's say manufacturing, and there's much less changes in the number of employers over time, em employees over time. It's just they they restrict entry into those occupations, and the number doesn't change. So we looked at unconditional changes in the number of workers by occupation, and it turns out the opposite, that um, in our time period, 
there's m bigger changes, unconditional changes, not related to migration, but unconditional changes. So it seems that tradable occupations are more flexible than uh, non-trade occupations, which, which, so that's kind of the only thing I could say in terms of other policies that might restrict changes in the number of, 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 of workers. Um, and in terms of licensing, I think that's a, that's a great suggestion of a different type of, uh, of, of, of policy that, that we can consider. I mean, em empirically, in the end, I mean, if you believe our, our instrument, then we're just documenting what happens, where do workers move, but in terms of uh, other kind of factors, I think that's 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 an interesting one to to, to to think about. So first, let me say, let me thank um, Oleg for the excellent discussion and the very good points, and they actually go together with some of the other issues that were raised. Um, one of the things that we don't do in this paper uh, is to think about the impact of the China shock on employment. Uh, it is sort of a textbook model in the sense that we take as in standard uh, trade theory the labor supply to be perfectly inelastic. So all the, all the, all the effects go through changes in wages and prices. Um, we've, uh, we have a section where we explore uh, these issues. Um, one could think about changes in employment happening because of people moving out, people commuting out uh, of the region, as Esteban and co-authors have emphasized, uh, or because people decide to uh, stop working. Uh, this is something that in, in a paper by Lorenzo is, is uh, one of the mechanisms. I think this is a, a very rich agenda. Um, I'm, I am, um, so on the commuting, on the, on the, um, there, there are empiri the, the empirical evidence uh, is, at least for the China shock, is not, at least for the time periods that we've looked at, we don't have a lot of evidence that people are moving out of regions that are negatively affected. The regions that are <coughs> negatively affected tend to be next to each other, so it's hard to imagine that commuting is going to be a big channel through which people are, are, are going to uh, stop working in their commuting zones. Um, and when you try to think about uh, people no longer working because they're going down because of a labor supply curve that is um, that has some elasticity. The problem is it's hard to square that with the evidence on the labor supply elasticity. So I think this is a, a, one of the things I'm working on now is on nominal wage rigidity. Perhaps with nominal wage rigidity, one can uh, get some effects of uh, of the China shock on actual unemployment. Uh, that, that that arises because wages don't fall enough, and maybe there that's an area where labor unions have have a have a role to play. Um, there was a question about um, uh, possibility that different groups are affected differently, not only not on the income side but on the price side. Um, that's something that we don't uh, allow for in the model. Um, there is some evidence uh, by Bay and Stumpner that says that there is not that much heterogeneity geographically uh, in terms of the way in which prices are affected by the China shock, but that's something that uh, one could, one could uh, look more into for sure. And let me just say the last thing is um, on the dynamics. I think that's a, that's a very important issue. We, again, uh, you know, using the, the excuse of a nice textbook model, we have a model that is static. We, you could think about this as uh, one steady state to the other steady state and not thinking about the dynamics. But in my defense, let me just say that the way we're estimating kappa is looking at a particular period. So if the, um, you know, so you could interpret our kappa as capturing what's happening um, uh, over this 2000-2011 period, if it is the case that in the very long run these effects disappear, then if we were to run this regression for over 50 years, then the kappa we would get would be infinite. And so, the, and, and maybe if we were to run it over a lo for shorter period, then the kappa would be lower. And so maybe this kappa that we're getting is sort of a compromise. I, I agree this is not the ideal way of doing things, but it is sort of a, a compromise that is that is capturing um, this this uh, you know the, the the importance of these issues.
over the transition that has taken place over the period that we're looking at. Okay, thank you very much to everyone.